hymns singing is a very important part of church meetings and from a very young age it's good for us to teach our children songs that they can remember by heart and it helps everybody you know the lovely song which we teach children jesus loves me this i know jesus loves me this i know for the bible tells me so little ones to him belong they are weak but he is strong and for older people jesus loves me this i know though my hair is white as snow and though my eyes are growing dim still i'll always walk with him yes join me jesus loves me yes jesus loves me yes jesus loves me the bible tells me so be like a little child i'm working towards that more and more because then we can trust god in a very simple way and when when we think of building the church it's not the clever and the mighty that god uses it's those who recognize their weakness and those who lean upon him that's what the lord has taught me through the years so we thought about the church as a three story building the first floor is a personal walk with god never never ignore that keep your conscience clear it's not something we graduate out of you'll never graduate out of it you remove that first floor everything upstairs will collapse so we need it all through our life and then we saw family life very very important and you cannot build a church i'll tell you a church that lasts you cannot build without a family life to me one of the earliest pictures of the church there are many pictures of the church the tabernacle for example is a beautiful picture of the church and if you study it there are many many lessons we can learn from that spirit filled people built it one of some of the first people who are spoken of as being filled with the spirit are the people who constructed the tabernacle the lord says i've filled so and so with bezalel with the spirit of god so that he can build the tabernacle very important and the temple and as the picture of the church where the glory of god the most important part of the temple was not the dimensions and the curtains and all that it was the fire when the fire was gone it was an empty shell and when the fire has gone away from your church whichever church you belong to it's an empty shell you know that the temple of solomon remained for a long time after the glory had departed that people got admired at what a wonderful building what wonderful mega churches but the glory is not there and they try to replace it with strobe lights and instruments and imitating the world world's musicians in the way they sway their hips and all that you can't bring the glory back with all of that god gives his grace to the humble if you have humble people meeting together it may be a small little hut the glory will be there but this big grand building with all those lights and fancy music and all that and the drums and the instruments the glory is not there is useless so when you go to a church what do you look for we want to build the church what do you look for if you look for music primarily or look for good friendships or you look for people who look like me my community you can't build the church because jesus christ is building the church with people of all races i like to be in a church where there are people of many races and who love jesus and who can demonstrate to the world around that we are one in christ
and it doesn't make a difference whether we belong to this race or the other race or the other race. And education-wise, we've got, we are thankful that in our church we have PhDs, doc, doctors of science, and also those who cannot read or write because they were too poor when they were small to be sent to school. Usually some, some of the older ladies in some of our churches in India, they, they can't read or write. They can't read a Bible. They can they have to listen to an audio Bible or something. So all types of people, and it's been wonderful to be one in Christ. That's the only type of church worth building. When you think of the third floor, don't build a racial church, all of one race, or all clever people. That won't be the church of Jesus Christ. Please turn with me to Colossians in chapter 3. It says here in Colossians 3, 10 and 11, put on the new self, being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And in this renewal, if you have experienced this renewal, Colossians 3.11, there is no distinction, no distinction between Greek and Jew. You see, I mentioned the other day how many Jews were taught to get up in the morning and say, Lord, I thank you. I'm not a non-Jew. I'm not a Gentile. I'm not a woman. I'm not a slave. But all that was demolished. In the church, there would be non-Jews, there would be um, slaves, and there would be women too, who were not given a place in the Jewish synagogue. The whole system was demolished when Christ came. We must not build that again. And it says here, circumcised or uncircumcised, religious rituals, we don't care for that. Barbarian and Scythian. Can you imagine a civilized Greek sitting next to a barbarian in the church? Barbarians are crude, very crude. And they've never been cultured, they've never, they don't know how to say thank you or sorry or any such thing. Uh, they'll stamp on your feet and go away. And they, imagine having people like that in the church and loving them. It's not, it's not evil. They've never learned culture. They've not, never been taught as children to say thank you, say sorry. They haven't learned all that, but they love Jesus. And you know, you know, I never understood who these Scythians were. <laughs> I discovered later on the Scythians were the ones whom the barbarians called barbarians. So these guys are not like us. <laughs> they were one step lower than the barbarians. I said, wow, what a wonderful church. I want to be in a church like this, where there are highly cultured, educated people, and really people low down, you couldn't go lower than that and one in Christ. What's the common thing? Not education, not the size of house they live in. One is in a five bedroom house and the other is in one small little hut. We have some of our brothers in our churches in India whose entire house is one room. That's where they sleep, that's where they eat, that's where they do everything. And, they, and very often there's no bathroom. You know, they go out into the, into the forests or in the jungles nearby, you know, just like way back in the beginning. It's so poor. In fact, one of those places, when we started a church, we built the first restroom in that village. <laughs> we built one in the church. And after that, some others began to follow. But we, in the beginning, we endured it. I mean, we do that. If you want to serve the Lord, you've got to do that. We have to be willing to go that if you, my wife and I have traveled to these places and what do you do? You just go out into the woods. <laughs> just like the Israelites when they were in the, uh, going from Egypt to Canaan. So if there's, if I'm always concerned, I want this and I want that, and I want a little comfort and all, brother, forget about building the church. Go and do some other business and make your money and live comfortably. If you want to build the church, you must be willing to sacrifice all your comforts and everything you think is so valuable and you say, I want to lead people to love Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if they're not like me. 
and they don't have the culture and the education and even the cleanliness. It takes time for a barbarian to learn how to be clean. He'll blow his nose right in front of you. And some of it may spray on you. You just got to ignore it. You want to be, live, live with such people? You want to, but if they love Jesus, they didn't get culture. Yeah, I've been with such people. And they love Jesus. They Slowly they learn to get better. I'm not saying we leave them like that. We, we give them education so the children can grow up and learn school. We pay for their um, college education. I'm not saying we leave them like that. But when they come initially, if you're particular about all these external things, I tell you in Jesus' name, you will never build a church. Forget it. Now, you may be living in a place where you don't have any barbarians. Well, that's fine. But there could be other ways in which they are different from you. And in the church, it says here, there's no difference. Slave, free man, Christ is all and in all. And in a poor countries, there's a tremendous difference between a master and a slave, which you don't see so much here in a country like the U.S. But in India, there and then in India, they have, you know, different caste levels from Hinduism. And many of our people in our churches have, have been converted from these castes. And they come to Christ. And it's, it's a new experience for them. In their entire life, the, they were taught when they're a non-Christian religion that you must not let the shadow of a low caste person fall on you. That will defile you. He walks by and his shadow falls on you. Those are the type of people when they get converted and they change completely. It's a wonderful thing. So... I'm talking about some extreme situations we were privileged to have. I, I really use the word privilege, privilege to have in India, because it tests my Christianity, whether it's genuine or not. And here you may find in some situation which is a hundred times better than that, and you can't bear with somebody for some little thing. If I can't bear with people, my advice to you is don't try and build a church. Go and do something else. Do business or something like that. Make some money. Live comfortably on earth. But don't ever try to build the Christ, church of Jesus Christ. So the tabernacle was one picture of Christ. And is, you know, if you read that, the way it was constructed, it was very exact. The Lord said, this must be like this, this must be like this, the dimension of this. Moses was not permitted to modify it. You know, if Moses had been given that job at the age of 40, just when he came out of Egypt, and he, had, you know, he was a guy who had studied in the highest academies in Egypt, how to build pyramids, which even today scientists are trying to figure out how in the world did they build it. Moses knew it. And if God had given him the pattern of the tabernacle, he said, Lord, just leave it to me. I built pyramids. Leave it to me. I'll build a fantastic tabernacle. He'd have built a fantastic structure. The only thing missing would have been the glory of God. The fire would not have been there, but it would be a tremendously impressive thing for people to watch. And if you look at the pictures, if you've seen a picture of the tabernacle, it is such a simple, unattractive structure. The only thing that made the difference was the glory of God. Curtains and poles and very unattractive. And the other thing I want to say is any Philistine could have made a tabernacle like that. You can make it today. Read Exodus and you can make it today. Exactly like that. But there's one thing you won't be able to duplicate. What is that? The glory of God. So you can, now I'm applying that to today. Uh, people come to Bangalore and say, Brother Zach, I want to build a church in our hometown. Tell us how we did it here. And they hear all the things and listen to all the messages. And they go there and try to, it's like the Philistines trying to make a tabernacle. The only thing missing will be the glory of God. The presence of Jesus Christ today. That's what, the equivalent of the glory of God in that fire on the tabernacle today is the presence of Christ and God Almighty in the church. What is the mark of a New Testament church? Primary mark. Tabernacle, what's the difference between, how do you make out whether this tabernacle was built by the Philistines or by the Israelites? In accordance with Moses, you examine it, look at it, it's 100% identical. As I said, the fire is missing. That's how you distinguish between the tabernacle imitated by the Philistines and the tabernacle built by Moses. Okay, in the New Testament, how do you determine 
is this a church built according to the Spirit of God or an imitation? When somebody saw something and said, we'd like to have something in our... Uh, we went for a conference and we found a wonderful spirit there and uh, we copied all the songs and we, we're going to sing those same songs here and we play some of Brother Zach's messages and we'll build a church here. You won't be able to build it. Because let me show you what I understand to be the mark of a New Testament church. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians in chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14 is speaking about, <clears throat> you have phrases like, verse 23, the whole church is assembled together. It's an expression in the middle. It's talking about a church meeting and it, in many places it says that. And what happens in this meeting is, you know, it's not the pattern that is important. I told you, forget about the pattern. Some people have gone to 1 Corinthians 14 and say, okay, let me see the pattern. Uh, two, three prophets get up and speak and then somebody else shares the word. I've been in meetings like that, dead as a doornail. Dead as anything. Because they followed a pattern. It's the Philistines copying the pattern of Moses. But here, what is the mark of a New Testament church? Here's one little phrase which has struck me. It's a primary mark. It's the equivalent of the fire. And it's here in 1 Corinthians 14. He says some stranger comes in. Uh, the whole church is assembled together, verse 23. And uh, if they all say, if they all speak in tongues, that's not the mark. They'll, what will they say you are? What's the word? Mad. You go to a church and you find everybody speaking in tongues, what should you call that? Are you bold enough to tell them this is a mad church? And if they ask you who said that, I say, the Holy Spirit said that. In 1 Corinthians 14, 23, all of you are speaking in tongues and it says here, if you do that in a church, you're a mad church. You call it a Pentecostal church, I say it's a mad church. A lot of people get mad with me for saying that. When I say scripture. But if we share God's word, prophesying is speaking forth as God speaks. The number of people who speak is not the important thing. Some people say, oh, everybody must be given a chance to speak. But if they don't have a word from God, it's not prophecy. It's just wasting time. Somebody's airing their views. Somebody's read up something and he re repeats that. Or somebody wants to show how much he knows the Bible. Oh, I've seen all these type of things when try to build people build a New Testament church. We must follow the pattern, the pattern, the pattern. I've seen umpteen churches that follow the pattern, dead as anything. I wouldn't go there again and I wouldn't recommend anybody go there. They're following a pattern. Think of the Philistines following the pattern of Moses. They say it must be first two or three prophets must speak. Okay, let's see who are the ones who've got the gift of the word. Let them speak first. And then all the others can give a chance and boring like anything. I feel like getting up and going from there. I'm telling you the truth. It's not a pattern. That's what I discovered after many years. I also followed that. I thought pattern. These Anglican churches and Methodist churches, they're not following the pattern. They've got one pastor getting up there and speaking. And I tell you, sometimes those services are ten times better than these ones who are following a pattern. So I said, what is the real mark? So it's not a pattern. But it says here, when a person comes here, verse 25, that's the verse I like. Wonderful verse. A man sits there and he's convicted in his heart. Boy, how did that guy know the sin in my life? I don't even know him. I'm a stranger. I just walked in here and the guy preaches up there and he's speaking straight to me as if he knows my private life, as if he knows how I live with my wife and how I bring up my children. The secrets of his life are disclosed. Now, there are two reactions he can have to that. One, he can get offended and walk away, even in the middle of the service, walk away. I've had people walk away when they when in the middle of my preaching. I don't get disturbed. I say, I feel sorry for him, that's all. And uh, the other is, a person sitting there, even if he doesn't fall on his face, inwardly, he falls before God and says, oh God, this is you speaking to me. And God brought him there to be convicted. And here's the mark of a New Testament church. 
people recognize God is certainly in your midst. That is the mark of a New Testament church. That people come there, they attend one service, they say, I met with God, he spoke to me. He didn't frighten me, that's not how God appears, but he spoke to my heart and gave me hope for my life, the mess I'd made of my life, he gave me hope. He taught me that he came to earth to lift me up, not to push me down. I met with God. My brothers, that is how every single meeting of a New Testament church must be. And a lot depends on the leader, the one who primarily speaks God's word. I have gone back from meetings where I have spoken and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I don't know why. And I wept before God and I said, Lord, I didn't, I didn't feel that your spirit moved today. Is there something in me? I've gone home to so many meetings, judging myself. Every meeting. You know, I've already judged myself concerning yesterday's meetings. I do that all. It's just a pattern with me all my life. I don't walk away from my meeting and say, yeah, yeah, we had great liberty. No, I judge myself at the end of every meeting and wherever I've had a responsibility to share. And I say, Lord, it's not perfect. And I shall never give up till I reach perfection. Like if my children got 95% in some mathematics test, I say, excellent, but don't be satisfied. Aim for 100 he gets 99, I say, aim for 100. That's been my way. I don't pester him. I say, you did very well. You're probably 10 times better than everybody else in the class. But aim for perfection. Aim for perfection. And everything in your life, aim for perfection. Hebrews 6.1, in the King James Bible, it reads, let us press on to perfection. As a husband, aim to be a perfect husband. Perfect means a Christ-like husband. Aim to be a Christ-like wife. Aim to be a Christ-like father, a Christ-like mother. Aim for that. It may take all your life, but aim for it. I have not become totally Christ-like. I'm not the totally Christ-like husband or father. No, but I'm working towards it. And I think my children and my wife will say I'm a lot better than I was 30, 40 years ago. But I'm not perfect. I'm more aware of that than anybody else. I'm pressing on to perfection. And I believe that a New Testament church will be a bunch of people who, are, who have seen the glory of Christ and who are pressing on to be like him in their personal life. It doesn't matter if they can speak or not speak or preach or not preach. If they are pressing on to become like Christ, I tell you this, I've told people this. Dear brother, sister, you may be a, a sister who never gets a chance to speak in the meeting. Don't worry. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you've got a passion to become Christ-like, you just come and sit quietly in the back of the meeting. It'll alter, the pres it'll alter this, that meeting in some wonderful way because you're sitting there and you haven't spoken a word. You know, I have sometimes in airports, sometimes you're, I'm sitting next to some woman comes and sits there who's saturated with the latest perfume. And you can smell it from a distance. It's a very nice scent you get. If an earthly scent can be felt by people all around a certain area, why can't the glory of Christ influence a church? By, and that, that lady with the scent has never opened her mouth. She just sat there. And all of a sudden, you, hey, I, I smell something. Hmm. A nice scent from oh, this lady came and sat here. I believe that someone can come and sit in a church meeting and spread the aroma of Christ. Have you read that expression in 2 Corinthians? I'm talking about how to build a New Testament church. It's not pattern. So often I've, I've been to numerous meetings where they talk about the pattern of a New Testament church. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Never forget this. 
for everyone here. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. It's your private, victorious life at home, in your thoughts, in the way you speak, the way you behave, in the selfless, self-denying way you live at home. That is the triumphant life in Christ. It produces in you a sweet aroma. Aha! Uh -huh. I said, I have a scent that lady has. And it's manifested through you, leads to the knowledge of Christ in every place I go and sit down. That lady goes and sits down anywhere and everybody says, hey, who's this? Some lovely aroma of a scent, the latest scent that's probably paid a, a huge amount of money to get it. And you have to pay a price too, spiritual price. And it says here, we're a fragrance of Christ. What a lovely expression. The aroma of Christ. The fragrance of Christ to God, first of all, not to man. I'm first of all a fragrance of Christ to my Heavenly Father who delights in me and smells that aroma of Christ in me. It's a, it's not, I'm not producing it to impress people. If you're producing it to impress people, I'll tell you you'll stink. Spiritually, you'll stink. Make it a fragrance to God, first of all. Lord, I want the aroma of Christ which you see in my home, the way I deny myself <clears throat> for my wife and my children or for your husband, your children, and the way you ignore, ignore, that's the word, little mistakes that people make or accidents that happen. Oh, it's okay. It doesn't matter. Ignore. So often we make a big fuss over some little thing something slipped up. Maybe you... A very important message was given to your wife when you were in the office. Asked to pass it on to you. And your husband came back. She completely forgot to tell you. How do you deal with it? Maybe it was a contract that could have given you an extra $20,000. She forgot to tell you. Has the whole world collapsed because of that? Can you say, well, forget it, darling. Our aim is to follow Jesus, not to accumulate a lot of money in this world. If you forgot to tell me, it's okay. Maybe if God wanted you to tell me, I'd have heard it. Maybe God doesn't want me to have that $20,000. Maybe it'll ruin me. See something positive and God makes everything work together for good. I'll tell you this in Jesus' name. I'm not saying we shouldn't be careful. We must be more careful. That wife must be more careful next time to pass a message. But the husband must not get upset. Or if you told your husband to watch something on the fire and by the time you come, the thing is whole burnt up completely. That's fine. Darling, I think we should have bread and butter today for, <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> we are, I think we are loving food too much. <laughs> sure. Or if your wife doesn't make breakfast in time before you go to work. Lord, I realize this is the day I have to fast. I've not, been, I've not been fasting for a long time and now today I must fast a meal. You won't die if you miss breakfast, I'll tell you that. You will not die. If you take these things, there's an aroma that comes from your life and over a period of time, you'll be a person known as, a, as someone who never, never complains about anything. You aim for the highest yourself. You will judge yourself very severely. You'll deeply apologize when you have forgotten to tell something or <clears throat> done something that harmed another person or missed out on something. But you will never judge another. You'll be merciful. Can you imagine a home like this? Children growing up, watching a father and mother like this. They will build that church too when they grow up. They'll say, we want a home like we had with dad and mom. And they'll say, we want to build a church too. Imagine, generation after generation. That should be our passion. But it's this aroma of Christ. I hope you will be gripped by this. This is the equivalent of that fire. Following the pattern, you'll produce a dead setup 
which is a disgrace to Jesus Christ. Even though the pattern is right, you sing the right songs, you copied from Arul and these are the songs we sing, and you follow the pattern, two people speak and then somebody else is follow, it will be dead as anything. Seek for the aroma of Christ. That's the fire. And that doesn't come overnight. You know how long they take to make these perfumes? So many combinations of so many things. That's why it's so expensive. It's not something you can just put together and like you make a cup of tea or something. Put the tea bag in and it's there it is. The, uh, these sweet perfumes don't come out like that. There's a lot of labor behind it and that's why they charge so much. And exactly the same with the aroma of Christ. But think of the result that can come much more than that lady radiating, I mean spreading some perfume around. The aroma of Christ can produce permanent results in people who sit in that church. And I said, you don't have to be a preacher. You have to be Christ-like in your character at home, in the secret places. And that aroma will spread from you just by your sitting there. You don't even have to open your mouth. Without opening your mouth, the aroma of Christ will spread. Will you take that challenge and say, Lord, I want that? That is the meaning of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And don't be afraid to be different from others. I, for many years in my uh, church, I grew up in a, as I was born again, I was in a brethren assembly. I thank God so much for the tremendous emphasis they had on the Word of God. That was their major strong point. Study the Bible, study the Bible, study the Bible, right from the early days of the brethren. And they got rid of titles like pastor and bishop and all. They didn't have all that. And I appreciated all that. I learned that right from, right from the time I was born again. I got baptized there. But the meetings, we, every meeting was as if we were sitting in a funeral. Everybody was so serious and you wonder who died. <laughs> I tell you honestly, it was like that. I'm not trying to criticize them. That's exactly how I felt. Everybody you looked at everybody's face and it looked as if somebody in their family had died the way they were sitting there. There was no happiness. I was not like these children here. You saw how they have. Did you think any of them were in a funeral? How they clap and raise their hands and were so hesitant to raise their hands and slowly goes up. You know what the Bible said? Do you believe in obeying all the commands in the New Testament? Okay, here's one. Let me ask you whether you've obeyed it. If you love me, keep my commandments. 1 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> First of all, do you believe the Holy Spirit inspired this? Or did Paul write his bright ideas? The Holy Spirit inspired the, word, the New Testament epistles. And one of the things he writes... Of course, he writes about a woman must receive instruction, submission. I do not allow a woman to be a teacher. 1 Timothy 2.12. I accept that. Women can share the, their testimony or what the Lord spoke to them and is a testimony from the word, but they're not called to teach. Teaching is a position of authority. So we don't allow any woman to sit up in the church and teach. They can share their testimony. But that was not the verse I was talking about. A lot of men who like to emphasize that, here's what the men must do. This is the Holy Spirit saying, 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, I want men in every place to pray. How should they pray? Lifting up holy hands. Are you embarrassed to do that, brothers? That's in scripture. Are you feel a bit awkward when people around you raise their hands? It says, I want men everywhere. It was awkward for me growing up in a church where everybody sat it as, a, as if it was a funeral to go to a church where you raise your hands. Now it's, now it's very easy for me. I just got used to it. I do it even when other people don't raise their hands. I, I do it to the Lord. I don't care what people think about me. And I'll tell you, the truth. I believe it is truth. It is written in a book I read. 
which was written by a God-fearing man. He said he was very much against this Pentecostal teaching of speaking in tongues. But he knew there were some good people among them and some really sincere Christians as there, are in, as there are in every group. And he wanted to investigate this. And he found, you know, there's a lot of decay in churches. And today's Pentecostalism is not like the early days. It is so much better in the early days, like every church. I mean, the brethren, which I mentioned, in the early days were not like that. Think of men like George Muller, one of the most godly men who ever lived, who trusted God and cared for all. He was a brethren man. So I appreciate such people. And also the Pentecostals were, everything has declined through the, you know, a church sort of lasts about 40, 50, 70 years, and then it's another generation. The church which Paul founded in Ephesus, in Paul stayed there three years and planted a church. You see the same church in Revelation chapter 2 declined. It happens everywhere. The decay sets in because a new generation does not hold to the vision of the people who started it. That can happen anywhere. I remember once saying this somewhere and somebody asked me, Brother Zach, do you think that will happen to CFC? Yeah, if God doesn't find godly people who will lead the church forward, it will happen to us. The God has no respect of persons. Where he finds godly men, humble men who will lead the church, it will go on. But if he doesn't find godly, humble men, it will just decay like everybody else. I believe that with all my heart. Because very often, a church starts and the founder knows God. He's in touch with God. And he establishes something. The followers just know the founder. The followers must know God. And in the, among the followers, if there are some who know God, the work will continue. But if they only admire the founder, it won't go anywhere. That's why my aim has always been to get people to know God. Know God intimately in your life. What I want to show you here is when this, this brother went to, decided to go to a Pentecostal meeting and, and yeah, he appreciated there were sincere people there who were praising the Lord genuinely and there were some people, there's not a screaming in tongues everywhere, not like some, there were some people who genuinely spoke in tongues and he had a little hesitation. And he says he had a strong objection to the raising hands. So everybody raising hands, this side people raising hands, this side people hanging. He was standing there solemnly. And he felt a spirit prompt him. Why don't you join them? Raise your hands. And he says, this is exactly what he says, and I believe it's the truth. As soon as he raised his hand, something broke within him, and he began speaking in tongues. Now you try and imitate that, it won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> It will not happen because you're imitating. That guy was responding to a prompting of the spirit. In your case, it may be something else. Go and apologize to your wife. That may be the thing that will set you free. It's different. It's depending on what the spirit prompts you to do, something very difficult for you to do. And you obey the Holy Spirit. It's that obedience, not the lifting of the hands, not the obedience that released him. So I'm just saying that I believe that the Lord wants to build new covenant churches and we must follow the principles of the new covenant as far as possible, not a pattern, but some things that Jesus said we must take seriously. For example, it says in Matthew 23, Jesus is instructing his disciples. He said, don't go just by a pattern. Look for the life. Example, Matthew 23, 2. The scribes and Pharisees, they have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Moses was there, now they are sitting there. And listen to this. Everything they tell you to do, please do it. Would Jesus say today to you, Whatever the Roman Catholic Church teaches you about worshipping Mary and all, please do it. Would he say that? Whatever the Jehovah's Witnesses teach you to do about Jesus not being Son of God, do it. Would he say that? Whatever the Methodists do of baptizing babies, do it. Would he say that? When Jesus says, not most of the things, everything they tell you to do, do. Who is he talking about? Scri Pharisees and scribes. He was putting a seal of approval on everything they taught, 
But he said, don't do according to their life. They don't practice what they preach. But do not do according to their actions. What they teach is right, but that's not how they live. They teach wonderful things in the church, applied to today. They teach wonderful in the church, in the church, but go and see how they live at home. And even the Pentecostal church, they speak in unknown tongues to God in the church. In the afternoon, they're speaking in a known tongue and yelling at their wives. What's that? It's hypocrisy. Don't do according to what they do. But what they're teaching is right. So there were people in the first century, in Jesus' time, whose teaching was absolutely accurate to the last dot. But their life was completely wrong. And Jesus acknowledged the doctrine is correct. You found, watch their doctrinal statement of the Pharisees turn to that. Everything is right, down to the last point. He tells the disciples, everything is right. But look at their life. No complete contradiction to what they've written. I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, this is the condition of many, many churches. You think the doctrinal statement is great. What they're singing is all true. What they're preaching is true. But go and live, see how they live. They don't do according to their deeds. Because they say things, but don't do them. So you'll never build a church if it's like that. So that's what we have to emphasize more than the pattern that we do according to what we believe in our home particularly. And he says, they tie heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. It's, we can hear of a high standard that's preached in CFC. And if you're not living according to that standard, you will not preach it in the right way. You'll preach, you must not lust after women. You must not get angry. It hasn't yet happened in your life. And you preach it and it's like a heavy burden you put upon people. Says that, that person, see a person sitting there. Says, boy, I see, ah, he showed it to me from Matthew chapter 5, those verses. But it's a burden. And it's not coming out of your life. And the Holy Spirit does not bear witness to it. And even though you're quoting the Sermon on the Mount, you will not build a church there. The fire won't be there. You'll try to build with a pattern. It'll be dead as anything else. It will be a Philistines trying to build according to Moses' pattern of the tabernacle. Because they tie heavy burdens and they don't lift them with their own, with a little finger. That means they don't do it in their own life. But they're preaching these high standards in the church. Christendom is full of this. That's why I warn you, don't come here and learn some standard and go and preach that and think a church will be born there. It will not. It starts with a life. I know the years I was defeated, so defeated, I'll tell you a time came in my life before, this was some years before CFC started. I said, Lord, I'm such a hypocrite that I was in full-time Christian work that I feel I should leave the Christian ministry altogether and stop preaching. I won't give up Christianity. I love Jesus, but I will go and sit in the back of some church and never preach again until... My life will back up every word I speak. And I said, Lord, I'm willing for that. I don't care what people call Jack has become a backslider. He was called to full-time work and he backslid and he's going and now getting a secular job and he's sitting in the back of some church, never preaching. Don't be like Zach. Don't be a backslider. Fine. I was willing to listen to all that. I said, Lord, I want reality in my life. I will not continue in this ministry unless... You do something in my life and make what I speak real in my private life, in my thought life, the way I live with my wife, the way I bring up my children. If it is not all correct, I don't want to speak it. Maybe I won't speak on that subject. It's like, you know, you, if you're a teacher, you can't teach a subject you have not learned, which you're not practicing. And I said that, and that's when God really saw that I meant it. And I hit rock bottom. That's when God filled me with the Spirit and turned my whole life around. The first church was born when 120 people were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not that they learned some new doctrine. They didn't go to a conference and learn how to build a New Testament church. They knew nothing. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And their lives were transformed. They were on fire. And when there's a fire, you can't hide it. And a painted fire can look like a fire from a distance, but when you get close, no light, no warmth. There are many churches like that. Talk about the fire and the Holy Spirit. 
no no warmth and no light. And there are many believers who can come to our churches, CFC churches, and say, oh, they believe in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about it. Brother, if it's not there in your life, people will see through it. I earnestly urge you, if you want to build a New Testament church, if you want to build that third floor, you've spoken about the first floor and the second floor and the third floor, seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We saw that even to build the family. Be filled with the Spirit and then husbands, wives and children, fathers. The same way here. You have to be filled with the Spirit. It's the secret of everything. Ask God and seek God and say, Lord, I'm willing to pay any price and I want you to give me an assurance. I don't want some man to say, yeah, yeah, brother, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not interested in that. Just like salvation. I don't want some man to come to say, brother, you're saved, you're going to go to heaven. What's the use of his word? And waking up in eternity in hell. I want the Holy Spirit to convince me that I'm really born again. And I never accepted it until I tossed around for five, six years. One day the Holy Spirit showed, told me clearly, Jesus has accepted you. From the word, not from some voice from heaven. Him that cometh to me, I'll not cast out. I had probably read that many times. One day the Holy Spirit said, that's for you. And my life was changed. It's like dropping an anchor. 64 years ago, I never drifted. From that assurance, my, my life was up and down in many other areas, but I was absolutely sure Christ has accepted me. Many years later, in the same way, one day the Holy Spirit convicted me, not convicted me, convinced me, I have filled you with. The Holy Spirit filled me. That was January 1975. I've never doubted that. Though I have to walk in that light continuously. So that is why I have sent, I say from my own experience to you, dear brothers, seek an assurance from the Holy Spirit for everything you read in the Word of God. Otherwise you'll try to quote a verse and say I claim it and all that and it doesn't work. What's the use? So whatever you read in the Word, if you want it known in your life, say you say, Holy Spirit of God, make that real in my life. And you give me an assurance and don't let me get it from some man. Maybe some man I respect. No, 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 no. Never get an assurance of divine things from some human being. Why should you? When the Holy Spirit is in the world and the Holy Spirit can dwell in you and see this verse, Romans It says in Romans in chapter 8, verse 16. Great verse. The Holy Spirit himself testifies with my spirit that I am a child of God. Have you experienced that? All of you sitting here? The Holy Spirit testifying, you know, like Testifying is a court word where a person hands up, holds up his hand and says, I swear, so and so, so and so, puts his hand on the Bible, I swear I'm going to speak the truth. Testify. The Holy Spirit's testifying to my spirit, you're a child of God. I don't care who you are, how young you are, don't rest until you got that assurance. I'm not trying to shake anybody's faith here. But I've seen people who don't have that after some time, they say, I wonder whether I'm born again. Because some man said, yeah, yeah, you're okay. Don't be satisfied. I never go and tell a person that you're a child of God. I don't know. I say, if you really are, the Holy Spirit will bear witness to you. That I'm absolutely sure he did for me. And even though it took me many years, I finally got it from the Holy Spirit. Definitely. It's like getting a genuine currency note certified by the Federal Bank or whatever there is in the U.S. So this is a genuine currency note. There are a lot of fakes in all currency notes in the world. And I don't want a fake one. I don't want to imagine I'm rich with a whole bunch of fake notes. And I don't want to imagine that I'm a child of God if the Holy Spirit hasn't borne witness to me. I would say that to every one of you. So the same way with being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be satisfied with what some man gives you an assurance or some experience you had. Everything can be fake. Let the Holy Spirit assure you and how will I know that I'm really filled? Well, I'll tell you what Jesus said. Forget about all the 
proofs of all the denominations. Let's go to what Jesus himself said to the disciples right back in the beginning. He told them to wait until they he told them to wait in Jerusalem. See Acts chapter 1 verse 4. Jesus gathered them together. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. I'm telling you how, how about building the church, that third floor. He commanded them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father promised, which is the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming upon them. It's the first time in human history that the Holy Spirit was going to come and indwell people. Until then in the Old Testament, he came upon people, upon, 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 upon. But he was going to first time, Jesus dwelt with the, lived on earth with the Spirit indwelling him. And he said, my dear disciples, the same thing is going to happen to you. The Holy Spirit will come within. And they waited, waited. And John immersed you in water. Instead of baptized, baptized, read immersed. You'll understand it better. Baptized is a Greek word. Why should you read Greek when you know English? I read it like this. Jesus immersed. It's, baptized is a Greek word. The Greek word bapto means if I dip my hand in a bucket of water, the Greeks would say he baptized his hand in the water, in the bucket. So it's a Greek word. Uh, John immersed you in water, but you will be immersed. Don't you understand it better? With the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. And he said, uh, what does that mean? Are you going to stir it? When I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's going to be some kingdom for me? Some new, I'll become an authority in some church or some new kingdom in my area? No, 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 no. Leave that to God. I'll tell you what will happen. Jesus said, you know, we also, we can seek the power of the Holy Spirit to establish our kingdom, to become a great preacher, or to establish a church and get a name for ourselves. That's the meaning of a kingdom. Lord, will you establish, when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, will you establish your kingdom here? Forget it. That's not what I'm talking about. But something better than that. Verse 8, you will receive power. Not tongues. You will receive power. Power for what? Power to be my witnesses in increasing circles from where you are right now. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That has been our experience since God met us, met with us and filled us with the Spirit 48 years ago. Bangalore, Karnataka, India, it's gone to the uttermost parts of the earth. Through the YouTube, not through missionaries, but through YouTube. It's gone to 186 countries now. The uttermost parts of the earth. And we are a poor little group of people sitting in India, one of the poorest nations. And God could do it. He can do it anywhere. The Holy Spirit is not limited by anything. He can do it through you. And we didn't make an effort for it. It's not me struggling and planning and like Coca-Cola planning to make sure Coca-Cola is sold in every country in the world. They made a lot of effort for it. We trust in God and Coca-Cola does it for profit. We do it so that people can hear the gospel and hear the true gospel that sin will not rule over you when you are under grace. That is the true grace of God that will enable you not only to be forgiven but to overcome sinners, overcome sin. And will enable you to build a godly home and you can live in a happy, loving relationship as husband and wife. And you can bring up godly children who will carry on the message to another generation, who will produce more children to carry on the message to another generation. That should be your burden. Look at Paul was not a married man, but look at the burden he had. He prayed for Timothy to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy in chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, Timothy was like his son. And if you got a son or daughter, this is how you should, this is how you should, what you should tell them. Timothy was Paul's son. He says, you fathers, if you've got sons and daughters, speak like this to them. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 onwards. Great advice. You therefore, my son, or in your case, my daughter, be strong 
in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual father and mother should say this to their children. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in our home, you remember my, my girl, my son, what we taught you in our home from the word, what you heard in the presence of many witnesses, your other children and your mom was here, you heard us teach you in the home, you go and share that with, look for faithful people of your age when you grow up. Find people like that. God lead you to them. Not clever people. Forget the clever people. Faithful people who are faithful in the little things, who are faithful not to get into debt, who are faithful with money to pay their taxes, who are faithful to obey words of scripture, who take seriously overcoming dirty thoughts. Faithful men and don't stop with them. Make sure they go and teach others. How many generations is that? Paul, Timothy was second generation. He says, entrusted to faithful men. That is the third generation. And they must teach another. By the time you get to verse 2, it's become fourth generation. Imagine a father. Many of you are fathers and mothers. Do you have a burden that your children should grow up and serve the Lord wholeheartedly. I don't mean full-time work, but be wholehearted disciples. And that they should train their children, third generation, to be wholehearted disciples. And those children must train the fourth generation to be wholehearted disciples. That's the New Testament pattern. Generation to generation. I have that burden. I had that burden for my four sons. And now I have a burden for the 17 grandchildren I have through them, that they will grow up in their generation and be witnesses for Christ. I'm not wanting them to be famous. Of, you know, I'm not asking any of them to be preachers like me. No, preaching is a unique calling God gives to somebody. I'm not asking them to go and plant churches or preach like me or be a Bible teacher. Nothing of the sort. Be a faithful witness for Christ. It says The word used here is faithful, not gifted. I have a gift. Many people who have gift are not faithful. Satan had gift and he was utterly unfaithful. He still has the gift. Many gifted preachers are totally, totally unfaithful. They do their work for money. What is required is faithful. Teach your children to be faithful, even if they have no gift. Faithful in the little things. Faithful never to tell lies. And start at home. Be honest. And if you blundered somewhere, admit it. Faithful when they start earning money, to be faithful in money, never to get into debt, faithful, faithful in never to hurt others. If you do accidentally hurt someone, faithful to apologize. That's what we have to teach our children. That's how we build the church. And we teach people in the church, be faithful, brother. Don't seek to have a gift like me. I have so many people, you know, who used to come to our church and they wanted to preach like me. And I had to correct them. I said, please don't imitate me. There's a gift God's given me. And he may not have given it to you. He, he doesn't give it. He maybe gives it to one out of a thousand people and you're one of, not one of them. But you can be faithful. And God will give you a particular gift that you have. And you can do your part to build the church. Why do you want the spectacular thing that will help you to sit in the pulpit and get some honor? I never sought this. I can honestly say I never sought this. God put me up here and I have to do my job. And I'd be very happy if he put me in some last seat as well. It's exactly the same to me. Because God is the one who determines... So teach your children to be faithful. Teach the brothers and sisters in your church to be faithful. Look for faithful people. This is how you will build the church. And I pray that wherever God leads you in the days to come, as a result of this conference, you won't look for a pattern. Remember what I said. The Philistines could Im imitate the pattern of the tabernacle exactly. See if there's a fire. When you have a meeting... See if people go away and say, boy, God was certainly there. The Lord was certainly there. He spoke straight to my heart. That's the type of meeting you should covet. Not just occasionally, and the rest of the meetings are all boring. No. God is never boring. The fire on the tabernacle was not there one day and uh, disappeared the next few days and then again suddenly fire. That's not how the tabernacle was. The fire went away and the, when the people became unfaithful. 
as long as the Israelites were faithful, the fire was there. When the fire went away, they knew they were unfaithful. You read in the book of Ezekiel how he sees the glory shifting away. And then towards the end of the book, you see the glory coming back. The Lord says, I can bring it back. And it's wonderful to see that. And I've seen that happen in churches. Uh, let me show you that passage in Ezekiel. It often comes to my heart. And turn to the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> Ezekiel, chapter 40 onwards, you find about the pattern of the, it's a picture of the New Testament church from chapter 40 onwards. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 43. I looked in the gate facing these and I saw the glory of the Lord coming. And I saw the vision. The glory of the Lord came into the house and the Spirit lifted me up into the outer, in the inner court and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And there are other passages you can look earlier on when he says he saw the glory going from here to there and there and there and there. I think it's chapter, I'm not sure exactly where it is. Uh, earlier on, the glory moving away. And then he sees it coming back. So when the glory is departed, it's there's nothing in that church. It's a dead shell. It's like this man was a very effective man, but right now he's dead. Yeah, the nose is there, the ten fingers are there, the ten toes are there, but the guy's dead. That's another example of pattern. You can have a church where everything is correct, the ten fingers, ten toes, but well, the guy's dead, man, what's the use? I'd rather have another church which doesn't have all that pattern. You know, some guy with only one hand, only five fingers, one hand is lost. But he can do something, he's alive. That's an example of a church which is not following the pattern but it's just got life. So seek for, to build a church where people will sense God was there. Be a man who when they meet with you and talk to you, they feel they've encountered the Lord in some way. And you don't have to be a very clever person for that. You have to be a very humble person. God is with a humble person. He can be with a woman. A humble woman. God will be with her. Yeah, there have been saintly women through the years, people have gone and spent a few minutes with them. They've gone away and counted God. I remember in my younger days as a Christian, I used to meet one or two people. And I remember one man particularly who came visiting Bangalore. I never knew him. I still forgot his name and all now. But it was very few days I met him. He had come on a visit from England, I think it was. And I never, we never talked about church or pattern or anything. But... I saw something of the radiance of Christ in his life. That today, 45 years later, I haven't forgotten it. Even though I don't know his name. That I saw, and I've been, now and then I've come across some men like that. They were not gifted preachers. I didn't ever even heard them preach. But in conversation with them, I felt there was, this man has got a glory of Christ in his life. My dear brother and sister, even if you never become a preacher, pray that the glory of God will be manifested in your life. God will be able to do a work through you. You may never become famous. Nobody may know your name. Your name may not be published anywhere. But one day when Christ comes back and you stand there, you will see the result of your life, even a sister, if you're a sister like that. And you hardly anybody noticed you, but there was something... You walked with God in secret and people were blessed through you. Be a brother and sister like that. That's how you'll build the church. Build your personal life, your home, and the church. I pray that will happen in all of your lives. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for these days that you brought these wonderful brothers and sisters here to hear your word.
I don't know whether I've said everything you want me to say. I don't know whether I've said it in the way you want me to say it. I don't know whether I said something I shouldn't or I left out something I should have. But Lord, you're not limited by human limitations. I pray in spite of our weak efforts, I pray your Holy Spirit will so move upon every single person who has sincerely come here and bowed their heads seeking you. I pray this will be a life-changing weekend. And yeah, I'm really praying for that, Heavenly Father, that this will be a life-changing weekend for a number of people who took the trouble to come here. Despite human limitation, Lord, do it, we pray. Your Holy Spirit will move and work and there will be results from this weekend here in many parts of this country and other countries from which people have come. And the glory will all be yours, even if we see the results only in eternity. We pray there will be eternal results. Bless everyone, Lord. Protect those as they travel back. Give them a safe journey back to their homes. Bless their families. We pray the aroma of Christ will increasingly spread from their lives. They'll first of all, go home and spread it to their wives and children and then to others around, not seeking anything for themselves, but seeking to glorify you. Do a work, Lord, as this country is so needy and the countries these folks have come from, different countries, is so needy. And the world is drifting away from you with all the wretched things being taught, even in many churches. Help us to, all of us, to seek you to establish a pure testimony for you in many, many places. We humbly ask, pour out your spirit on us that it will be fulfilled. We pray in the name and for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.